Oh, hi. Should I look at the camera or look at you? Look at the camera. Should I wave? You want to. Good, good. My name is David Zack. I am the executive director of Pride Films and Plays, and my pronouns are he, his, and him. My name is Jafei Chang. I am currently an assistant professor in the Department of Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Scripps College. My name is AJ Jennings. Um, I work at the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance, and I'm the curriculum and professional development director here. Um, I use the pronouns they, them. My name is Jessica Paul. I am a student at Columbia College Chicago. I'm a junior in the creative nonfiction writing program, and I aspire to be a journalist who works with young people to help them read and write better. My name is Mark Arnault. I'm a librarian, and um, my pronouns are he, him. My name is Michael Cicchetti. I am an actor, a writer, um, a, a, a producer of film, and uh, I'm still actually figuring out a lot of what these roles and titles are. My name is Tracy Bame. I'm publisher and executive editor of Windy City Times newspaper in Chicago. I use uh, she, her pronouns. And what are some labels you would use to define your identity? Well, uh, some labels that I would use to identify who I am are black or African American, Christian, lesbian, queer, woman, feminist, things of that nature. I would define my identity by just using gay. I'm a dad, I'm a teacher, I'm gay, and I'm a nice guy. I would say I'm a journalist, I'm a woman, I'm a lesbian, I'm a Chicagoan. Those are some of my, I think, favorite identities. News reports when I was growing up, um, the, the AIDS crisis was full blown um, in my teenage years. That would be on the news a lot. And so that kind of media uh, negativity would make it hard to want to identify that way. It would make it hard and scary to, I to identify as a gay person um, because that often meant it came with those very high risk situations and so um, the media probably helped keep me uh, in a closet for a lot longer because of the fear that those those reports would would uh, drive home for somebody in my generation. It was really hard to find representation when I was younger. I don't have a lot of clear memories of um, seeing myself in ways that were not in the heterosexual cisgender um, categories, like I might have seen other elements of my personality reflected, but not elements that I now identify in relation to my gender and sexual orientation. I have felt like I was a journalist since I was 10 years old. I come from a journalism family and it's all I've ever wanted to be. Um, but in college I learned that being openly gay in the early 1980s era um, and wanting to be a journalist was actually not something that I might have been able to reconcile. I didn't know there was a gay press um, at the time and I was told that I really probably couldn't be openly gay and be, in, be a journalist, so I was actually pretty devastated. The way that I understood that there was a gay identity was not through my parents. You know, it wasn't through education, it was through media. So it was through the news, you know, seeing um, gay rights issues usually related to HIV AIDS or um, the character on the real world or Ellen, you know, it was it was or Will and Grace or You know, whatever Gay people were on MTV at the time, you know, that was that was pretty much it in terms of an awareness what I think is um, Hard is that not all the stories are presented equally uh, all the stories by people of color are hard to f come by uh, The lesbian stories are very hard to come by and while gay culture has a relatively consistent uh, arc from Oscar Wilde to Tennessee Williams to um, to Angels in America to Kinky Boo um, the, the arc for lesbian plays is is barely there um, and so I think that's a sad thing and that would if I was part of the LGBT community that wasn't you know represented by white gay authors I would be frustrated by the fact that my stories have not been given the same amount of respect or or time or money or resources as they deserve for me to talk about it with people who say to me 
for instance, my family or my therapist, oh my gosh, why are you feeling like, you know, you know, like lonely? Because there's a huge increase of LGBTQ people in mainstream media. And there's also, there's more people of color in mainstream media. And I said, okay, a lot more LGBT white people, a lot more people of color who are seen as straight, but very few in between. And I think that's made it difficult to articulate the intersections of the lives that are not represented. But I also question whether or not representing more of those lives necessarily means that we're addressing the complexity of people's lived experiences. Representation for a queer black Christian woman living in Chicago has been scarce. I came out at 24 when I was, uh, well I try to come out many times throughout my life and for that, at that age I came out for my own self-acceptance and so getting to Columbia and seeing this flag hanging I just wanted to like hone into it. I wanted to grab it and touch it and be all of the queer pride. But I'm I'm sitting here watching it, looking at it on 8th and Wabash. Meanwhile, I have to commute back to 95th Street and, and it almost feels like going back into my closet, which I no longer fit in. With the Alliance, we do um, youth programming events too. So we do a five day sleepaway summer camp um, for young people to, to come to. And always the response of that as young people are there and getting ready to leave campus, I wish this was longer and I wish that it felt like this at home. Um, th that recognizing that they're, um, that going in back to their home communities that there often is not that sense of queer community within the home community and that's a, a sense of, of loss and longing for, for young people. So I went to high school in the years 1995 to 1990, no, I'm sorry, 1991 to 1995. And during that time, HIV AIDS was definitely in the news, but my, inf my access to that information really was really strained as a student, as a high school student in Orange County, California. Um, I think my school newspaper was one area in which we could talk about feminist issues like being pro-choice or um, you know, the enforcement of teaching English only in classrooms. So there were issues that we, we worked on that were anti-racist and feminist, but it was still hard to talk about queer issues, LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to really express. My, my teacher never said, don't talk about it, but you just kind of knew that there might be a reaction from people that um, might be too difficult to handle in that environment. So most of my access to LGBTQ representation was outside the high school setting. Things that you don't talk about are bad. You know, like, we don't like to talk about death. People don't like to talk about emotional pain. People, things that you don't talk about intrinsically are things that are bad, right? So when you're not talking about sexuality, and when you're not talking about sexual minorities, you're not talking about, you know, the different articulations of that sexuality, intrinsically, you internalize that as something that you should be ashamed about. Right around the end of my sophomore year, Everything came crashing down and I couldn't handle the symptoms of my mental illness. But between ages 15 and 25, I had probably been hospitalized in the psych ward like 20 times. That's a 10 year span, so that's almost two times a year. So being gay I had to wait and yet it couldn't because I was having all these strong feelings and I just didn't know how to deal with it. So. I believe I was 16 and in a, my uh, best friend's grandmother's bathroom and I, I, I blacked out. I, it was too much. And I uh, took a bottle of Advil and emptied the bottle out in my hand, counted 24 pills and I swallowed them all. Didn't drink much water, told my friend, um, but I didn't tell my mom that I took that many pills, told her I only took three. Went to the psych ward that night. They didn't pump my stomach because they didn't know. I'm in this room by myself, sitting on the toilet. I'm in a cold sweat. And I'm thinking like, God, I, there were no words, but the, the thought feeling was, I don't want to die. I'm not ready. But I didn't know what was going to happen. And I felt something burning in my body. Years later, I realized that the pills filtered through my liver. And here I am today, stronger for it. and being reminded that my life is for a purpose. I don't know why suicides go through or don't go through, but here I am and so I cherish my life and I want to help save others from the agony just in knowing that they're not alone. The first time that I heard gender neutral pronouns was reading the book Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy, um, where in 
that book, they, they have people whose pronouns are per for person, and that just like completely blew my mind. And then a couple of years later, I heard people using they, them, and I was like, oh, that's me. That's what I want to be doing. I think the importance of seeing your own storyline on stage is that it gives you hope. It gives you truth. It gives you some sense of who you are. I remember a subscriber at Bailiwick Theater many, many years ago standing up after a performance of the Lisbon Traviata by, by Terrence McNally and just coming out at that point, just saying, that's who I am. And he had always been um, closeted. And, and is, um, you know, it was really, that was obviously really an important moment in his life. Through my schooling, it would have been really um, helpful um, and, and, and healthy uh, to have, it, it's always best, in my opinion, it's always best if people who are gay are out um, and, they, and they make it known around them that they are who they are. Um, it would have been very helpful for me growing up through my education to have known that a particular teacher was gay or a particular teacher um, was bisexual or what, whatever. Um, it would have been helpful to have known a role model that was also gay. I didn't know anybody. Oh man, what was it like being closeted in high school? Oh, it was torture. I, I was, one of the proudest days was when I could participate in the Day of Silence sophomore year and if I'm not mistaken, the day of silence, well, we would wear like a blue band tied on our arm and we would be silent the whole day. We wouldn't talk, not to teachers, not to anybody. And it was an honor of the voices and the stories that have been silenced, uh, the voices that took their own lives, the voices that are closeted. And I never got to go to the rally at the end of the night where they just told stories and they broke the silence. That was the whole point to a degree for those who couldn't tell their stories, others would step up and, and be courageous. And it was the one moment, quite, quite like that flag moment, where I am acknowledging my identity. I am acknowledging that I exist. I, I am connected to something bigger than me that isn't just me. And I, I don't wanna throw anybody under the bus, but I, I just wasn't allowed to join the Gay Straight Alliance and it was just really hard. I was just seeking, I was seeking representation. I was seeking connectivity. I was seeking knowledge and understanding. I didn't know how to connect to the LGBT community. My experience encountering gay people, uh, I went to a very conservative school, culturally conservative, educated but culturally conservative, um, which I don't think was that unusual. You know, my partner and husband went to school in San Francisco at that time and he said he had a kind of similar experience. People were not just openly out in social circles. You know, it was known that there was some gay teachers. There was maybe one person that I knew that had come out as gay. Um, within my class of 65 students, I know of, uh, I think there's four or five of us that are gay. It's really interesting. None of us were out. It wasn't really an option. So like being out, being gay, it was just kind of, an, and I, I've said this before, like in math there's that DNA and calculus does not exist. So that's really what it was. Uh, Pride Films and Plays was started in 2010 when I was working in South Korea. After a long history of, of doing theater here in Chicago, it was exciting to have a break to go teach and direct in South Korea. And at that point, I really spent a lot of time looking back at American uh, film and American plays that have LGBT films or characters or themes or characters and so that was one of the things that I decided when I was over there working was that I really thought that we could connect through the internet with writers around the world to express a more universal point of view about what we as gay artists could present on film or on screen. I feel really lucky that we have great people, great teammates who have joined us over the years um, so that Nelson Rodriguez is the artistic director, Derek Van Barham is associate uh, artistic director, John Nasca, artistic associate. There are lots of people who've been a part of it for a number of years, and you could never build an organization without a big team. So we feel pretty confident that even though not all those people have full-time jobs here, that we uh, have enough people of different ages, of different types, of different uh, personality types, that what we can present over the course of a season is a really, uh, a really great uh, menu of all the different letters in the LGBTQ 
Blue Alphabet, and that there's stuff here that we that we feel appeals to our older audience members who are probably donors and would like uh, musicals or, or more Priscilla sort of things, um, as well as young people who really are excited about spoken word or comedy or uh, more progressive art forms uh, that our older audiences wouldn't necessarily go for. But the joy of having our own space is that we can do both and that we can give people every every month a, a smorgasbord of what they can choose from. I appreciate being in queer spaces like this quite a bit uh, because uh, using the bathrooms is so much easier. <laughs> so, so much easier. There's all these rules and regulations that people are trying to put on pooping right now and it's not great. <laughs> I, uh, looking at like a, a, a trans brothers and sisters and everyone in between, has, there's people with a lot harder time walking into bathrooms. Uh, for me, I choose to use the women's room because that's where the hot gossip is. <laughs> But like it does cause problems sometimes. Um, and I understand if I walk into the women's room and someone walking out might go, ooh, like that's all right. That just lets me know that I'm doing it right. <laughs> but I can tell when they're trying, when they're like, ah, you know, like, you tried. Like you, you tried to let me know that you're uncomfortable and I know it. Um, I'm honored to have been a part of SheFest this year. I danced to Rihanna's um, Love on the Brain I was so empowered. In each act for SheFest, it was different, it was raw, it was unique, it was special to that person. They share their story or they read a poem or they tell a joke or whatever it is, whatever their craft is they're presenting that night. And it's like, oh my God, I didn't even know that I needed you to touch my life in that way. And to connect in this very special way of love and community is something that I can't imagine being deprived of. My professional role is I work at the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance and we do advocacy for LGBTQ young people across the state of Illinois. So as the curriculum professional development director, most of my work is really centered in going into schools to work with educators about how to make their schools more affirming for LGBTQ young people. Um, so some of that is just um, a lot of 101 education, recognizing that a lot of people who are adults had no exposure to LGBTQ identities in any sort of formalized education setting. So there's a lot of back work that needs to be done to just understand language and terminology and help folks recognize the importance of including LGBTQ identities in their curriculum. Um, and so a lot of it is, is at that very base level step. And then um, working with folks to think about how can they take their existing curriculums and infuse um, LGBTQ identities throughout curriculum so it's not just in, say, English class or health class, but that rather no matter what your content area is, there's ways to bring in LGBTQ identities and issues um, and help people gain comfort and confidence in doing that is really the big piece of my role. I feel that teachers have a responsibility to, um, to bring more diversity into the, into the curriculum, to bring in um, more experiences for students and it doesn't have to be in strong, overt ways. It just needs to just kind of happen naturally. Like, for example, in a math classroom, uh, you know, if you were to do a story problem, a, you know, a word-based math assignment, and some of the people in the story, like uh, David and his husband, are going out to buy a car, like that kind of subtle um, reminders to people that there's all different types of families and, and people in the world, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really powerful thing. And uh, um, I think it's important to consider those things when teachers are delivering. As a professor in feminist, gender, and sexuality studies, I do oftentimes hear from students that they're excited to take a class for the first time that's dedicated to issues of race, gender, class, and sexuality, and especially queer and trans of color lives. Um, and most students don't come from high schools where they're taught this. There, I have a few that have had that kind of experience, but most students don't, and most other courses across campus don't teach it. So if I get to teach them in their first year as freshmen, or if they're taking the class for the first time, even as like upperclassmen, I do tend to hear um, things like, you know, this is the only class, not not just because of me, but the, the curriculum, this is the only class in which I'm able to talk about everything at the same time and bring all parts of my lives into it, and also to be able to connect to people who are different from me.